بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا اله الا الله والله اكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا اله الا الله والله اكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا اله الا الله والله اكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا اله الا الله والله اكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا اله الا الله ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انا عليكم رقيبا صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين respected elders and brothers the topic that we have at hand today is an important topic in the sense that anyone who views and looks at the situation in our community anyone sometimes beyond our community will easily come to the conclusion that we have great problems in interpersonal relationships in the sense that we find disputes and arguments are quite frequent in our community we also find that when we talk about interpersonal relationship and what i would like to address today is not an interpersonal type of relationship on a specific scale in the sense that we only looking at for example relationship between husband and wife but we looking at relationship an interpersonal relationship across the board in our community whether it be between husband and wife whether it be between brothers and sisters whether it be between a person and his in-laws whether it be between business colleagues whether it be people who are partners in business whether it just be people frequenting the same masjid muslim brothers or even going beyond that just human beings on a general scale now we find that we find that this interper- interpersonal relationship upon which so much emphasis has been placed in our sharia today we can safely say that it is it at a low ebb and we look at today the islamic guidelines with regard to improving human relationship improving interpersonal relationship we can term it from the islamic terminology as human rights and also known in islamic terminology as huququl ibad the rights of our fellow human beings the only problem with regard to it when we talk about human rights somehow or the other our mind because of what we read in the media what we read in the newspapers tends to drift towards human rights in a political perspective we look at human rights in that particular perspective from a human rights angle the way the the charter of um, the united nation makes mention or makes it compulsory upon member states to uphold human rights but today we're not talking about in that sense and that is why a little bit of hesitant to use the words human rights rather use the word huquq al ibad the rights of our fellow human being but we talk about human rights although this particular definition would cover what we are trying to say but some of the other our mind as i said have drifted towards the the political sense the human rights in the political sense is a different matter because that is something that does not guarantee human rights the great emphasis upon human rights despite that that we find in today the political sense despite all that we still find an atmosphere or a system that has created an unjust global system which allows superpowers to invade other people's lands which allow the rich to dump their toxic waste in third world countries which allows the widening of the gulf 
between the rich and the poor which marginalizes religion and morality in a way with greatest impunity that is with regard to the human rights in the political sense here we are talking of hukuk al ibad in what sense in the sense of fulfilling the rights of your fellow human being whether that be your spouse your brother your sister your neighbor the person whom you meet in a masjid your business colleague or during business negotiations or whether it be just across the board to a fellow human being be it muslim or be it non muslim now allah subhanahu wa taala has placed great emphasis upon the rights of our fellow human being and as i said this is termed as hukuk al ibad in a sense not in all ways in a sense hukuk al ibad and the right that we owe to our fellow human beings is even more important than the rights that we owe to almighty allah subhanahu wa taala now understand this in its proper context because the rights that we owe to almighty allah subhanahu wa taala are supreme because allah taala is our creator and the first thing that we need to see to it is that our that we fulfill our rights towards almighty allah subhanahu wa taala but in what sense is the rights to our fellow human being more important in this sense that when you violate the rights of almighty allah then allah subhanahu wa taala being ghafurur rahim all forgiving all merciful it is more than likely that allah subhanahu wa taala provided you are sincere in your repentance that allah taala will turn towards you with mercy and forgiveness allah ghafurur rahim more than likely allah will forgive you but allah subhanahu wa taala has also decreed that the violation of the rights of your fellow being Allah has said that that would not be forgiven directly by Allah until the person who has been wronged he does not forgive you. Now, Allah Taala's situation is that Allah Taala is prone and inclined towards forgiveness. Human being unfortunately is not so inclined. He first finds it very difficult to forgive. Or in the words of Hazrat Maulana Thanwi rahmatullahi alayhi, awwal insaan kisi ko maaf nahi karta. First very difficult for a human being to forgive to forgive another human being. and even if he forgives even if he forgives a fellow human being he keeps a file of it in his memory bank that one day he'll remind you that you know you did that wrong and i forgive you this is how the human being is and allah taala when he forgives allah taala keeps no record of it attaibu min adham kama la dhamba la he who repents from his evil deeds is like one who does not commit that deed at all this is how allah subhanahu wa taala situation is A human being situation unfortunately is not like that now that is in this world that situation is in this world now can you imagine the situation in the year after where there will be a general atmosphere and environment of nafsi nafsi each and every one for himself even the pious people will have that particular environment of each and every one for himself worried about his own salvation because the atmosphere of the akhirat would be such the atmosphere of akhirat would be such that each and every one will be worried about his own self Now, when the situation like this is in this world, you don't forgive. Where is the human being going to forgive another person for the wrong that he has done upon himself in the year after, or wrong upon the other person in the year after? Where is he going to forgive? Very difficult. Therefore, in Bayhaqi, there is a hadith of our beloved Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said that there are three types of deeds. Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam has categorized deeds in various ways. In this particular categorization Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said three types of deeds one that will never be forgiven by Allah that is shirk shirk is the person who associate partners to almighty Allah inna Allah la yaghfiru wa yushraka bi Allah will not forgive a person who associate partners to almighty Allah that is the ultimate blasphemy towards almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the second type of deeds is the deeds and the violation of the rights between you and almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah taala if he wishes he will forgive and if allah doesn't wish allah won't forgive that is in the discretion of almighty allah subhanahu wa taala but of course if we are sincere in repentance it is hope that allah taala will forgive the third type of deeds is the deeds between fellow human beings that allah taala has decreed until you don't have it forgiven by the person whom you have wronged allah subhanahu wa taala will not forgive those deeds three types of deed nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam has categorized Now after understanding this first category with regard to this for the rights to our fellow human beings Islam has not only laid emphasis upon this but Islam has gone a step further and the step further Islam has gone is to promote 
that human rights, to promote the rights that we owe to our fellow human being. Now, this is the beauty of Islam. When Islam tells us to stay away from something, it blocks all the avenues leading towards that evil. When Allah Ta'ala has told us to not commit adultery, all the avenues leading towards that evil, don't be with a woman in privacy, don't touch a woman or vice versa, do not touch a, a person of the opposite sex unless it is a mahram, do not do so. Nabi Karim has said, do not cast glances at people of the opposite sex. These are all avenues to block you from the ultimate evil which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prevented you from and prohibited you from which is zina and adultery. In a similar manner, when Allah Ta'ala has emphasized the rights of our fellow human being, Allah Ta'ala has made it such that He has given us guiding and principles. How do we see to it that we fulfill the rights of our fellow human being? The first of those principles, I will make mention of it, and really many of these principles are such that would require a lecture on its own. But we will just briefly look at it so that inshallah at the end of the, the talk we have some sort of guidance, some sort of way that we say that what the Sharia has told us, how do we promote the, the rights to our fellow human being. The first of this is there has been so much emphasis with regard to how to fulfill the rights of our fellow human being that has brought about this principle in our Sharia that there is greater emphasis upon the fulfillment of your obligation and your dues to the next person rather than the receiving of your rights. Greater emphasis, you fulfill your obligation and fulfill your duties to the next person rather than the claiming and receiving of your rights. There is greater emphasis upon this. Now, One of the great problems that we are facing today, everyone fights for his own rights. No one fights that what is my obligation and my duty. We have in our in the constitution also, we have our bill of rights. We don't have our bill of obligation and duties. Now this, by its very nature, creates a climate of tension and conflict. When everyone is going to fight for his rights, it creates automatically a culture of tension and conflict. Therefore, Islam had said, based on this rational principle, what is a the principle? There is greater emphasis in Sharia for removing of harm than receiving of benefit. Greater emphasis upon removing of harm than receiving of benefit. Now look at the Quran. Allah Ta'ala says with regard to alcohol also. Yes, there is some benefit in it. But the harm is greater than the benefit, therefore stay away from it. The harm is greater than the benefit, therefore stay away from it. So the rationale in the Sharia is remove harm rather than the receiving of benefit. Yes, of course, if you receive your benefit without harm, then by all means, there is nothing wrong. So on this particular principle, greater emphasis, see to it that you fulfill the obligation and your duty to your fellow human being. And more than likely, more than likely, your corresponding rights due to you will also be fulfilled. If you fulfill your obligation and duty to your wife, or the wife does it to the husband, then more than likely, it will also happen that the wife and husband will fulfill the, the corresponding rights also. If you are fair towards your business partner, it is more than likely that the corresponding rights to you due to you will also be fulfilled, more than likely. But our ulama go a step further and say that even if it is not fulfilled, even if your rights is not fulfilled, you see to it that you fulfill your obligation and your duties and leave your rights to Allah. You see to it that you fulfill your obligation and duties and leave your rights towards Almighty Allah. The reason being, Allah Ta'ala on the day of Qiyamah, as I normally have made mention of it many a times, Allah won't ask an oppressed person, why were you oppressed? He won't, we won't have to answer. A person whose rights are not fulfilled, he won't have to answer before Almighty Allah on the day of Qiyamah. The person who did not fulfill the obligation and duty, he will have to answer. So as long as you fulfill your obligation, you are on the safe side, where it matters most. And if someone hasn't fulfilled your rights, let him go worry with regard to how he's going to answer before Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one aspect that sometimes we, we miss out. You know, lene ke liye ho to hum, dene ke liye ho to bare we are very quick to receive 
very, very reluctant to give. Time to, to receive, I'll receive it. Time to give, go ask my bigger brother, he will give it to you. So this is a culture that has been created which we need to get away from. And this is the first aspect, the first principle that we've got to keep in mind with regard to the, the fulfillment of the rights of others. The second thing that we need to understand is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the fulfillment of rights to others a universal duty irrespective of color and creed or irrespective of financial situation and position. Not that if my relative is wealthy, I owe him more or if he is less wealthy or is poor, I owe him less. In terms of human relationship, you are supposed to be good with everyone, irrespective of color, creed, financial standing, etc. This is what Islam has taught us. And we know that status on the day of Qiyamah would not be guaranteed by any other aspect other than a person's own quality, his own character, his own taqwa, and his own piety, not by any other external forces. This was clearly demonstrated repeatedly in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time and in the time of the Ashab. One incident that comes to mind, Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu was one day sitting and doing some work of the state and three influential people of the Quraysh came and met Umar radiallahu anhu. One of them was Abu Sufyan, Akrama bin Abi Jahal, in terms of tribal position, the cream of the Quraysh. Umar radiallahu anhu told his servant, go and tell them I am busy, I can't meet them now. After a while, the servant came and said, Bilal radiallahu anhu, Abu Zar Ghaffari radiallahu anhu, and Suhaib radiallahu anhu, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, wishes to meet you. Umar flung down his pen, whatever he was doing, left it, rushed outside, embraced them, and said, why, if you had worked with me, why didn't you come and tell me or send a message? I would have come to see me, see you. Why did you have to come and see me? Akram bin Abi Jal, Abu Sufyan, and them are all looking at this particular spectacle. One of them said, Ajab Ali ibn Khattab. We are amazed at Ibn Khattab. He leaves us and calls our former slaves. He leaves us and he gives preference to our former slaves in terms of meeting them. We are waiting here, but look at who he gives them preference. One of them was wise and said, it is no fault of Ibn Khattab. The caller towards truth and felicity and success gave the call to universally, gave it to everyone. They were first to respond. Because they were first to respond, they have priority. Umar radiallahu anhu gave them priority because they were first to respond to the, to the message of the truth. And not only Umar, on the day of Qiyamah, Allah also will give them priority over us. Fulfillment of rights irrespective of color creed, irrespective of who the person whom you are dealing with, is a fellow human being and you have to fulfill his rights. The third thing that we need to understand is that observance of the rights of others is not merely a good deed, is not merely a duty imposed upon, by, uh, upon us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it is an amanat, it is a trust about which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question us on the day of Qiyamah. Now sometimes we have this feeling that if I don't read my namaz, Allah will question me. If I don't keep my fast, Allah will question me, and definitely Allah will question us with regard to it. That is our obligation. But somehow it is that if I don't do good to another person, it is not something to do with deen. It is something that is good to do. But, you know, I won't have to account for it on the day of Qiyamah. This is a mistake. This is part of amanat. This is part of trust about which we will have to account for on the day of Qiyamah before Almighty Allah. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Nisa, the very first ayat, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ Fear Allah with regard to the rights of your relatives about which you will be questioned by Allah on the day of Qiyamah. It is this aspect of trust about the fulfillment of the rights of your fellow human being that made Umar radiallahu talanhu go and walk the streets of Medina to see if there is anyone who is underprivileged or anyone who is poor so that he could fulfill that person's needs as the leader of the Muslims. That particular aspect of Amana, trust. And Umar radiallahu anhu used to say, لَوْ مَاتَ جَمَلٌ عَلَىٰ شَتِّ الْفِرَاتِ لَخَشِيتُ أَيَّ سَأَلَنِي اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ If a camel dies on the bank of Euphrates in far away Iraq, far away from Medina Sharif, I fear Allah will question me on the day of Qiyamah, O oh Umar, you are in charge of those lands. You are, you are the authority on those lands. 
Why did a camel die of hunger while you were in charge and in reign over those lands? That aspect of trust is, is something that also applies to our human relationship, our interpersonal relationship. The third, fourth thing that comes to mind with regard to it, the fourth principle, with regard to the fulfillment of our rights of other people is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he makes mention of the rights of others in the Holy Quran, normally qualifies it with the concept of taqwa and piety. Concept of taqwa. What taqullah alladhi tasaruna bihi walarham, the ayat I've recited. Fear Allah with regard to the rights of your relatives. Because the greater the fear of Almighty Allah, the greater you would see the need for you to fulfill your fellow human beings' rights in whichever way. That is why there is so much emphasis upon taqwa. And what is taqwa? Taqwa, the greatest meaning of taqwa is the consciousness that Allah is with me at this time. Various meanings of taqwa, the ulama have made mention. One meaning is to fear Allah. One is to take great precaution that you're, you don't do any step or take any particular action which is against the commands of Allah. And the third most beautiful meaning is the consciousness that Allah is with me at all times. You know, Hazrat Umar was one day going and he passed a shepherd. And as Umar to test him, said that, why don't you give me one of those sheep? So he said, what am I going to tell my master? So he said, tell the master that the sheep got lost or the sheep was devoured by another animal. You can surely make ways and means and excuses of explaining one sheep. So the shepherd turned towards Umar and turned and put and pointed his finger towards the heavens and said, Fa'in Allah. What about Allah then? Where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then Umar radiallahu said, as long as there are people like you in this ummah, the ummah will remain prosperous. This is an aspect that at all times we fear Allah. Now look at, look at this aspect. Why did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam repeatedly read ayats of taqwa in the nikah ceremony, in the nikah khutbah? Again, because there is nothing greater than taqwa and the consciousness of Allah to make you fulfill the rights of your fellow human being. Especially in the case of nikah. I mean, nikah is such a thing. Many of the conversations and many of the aspects of nikah are between husband and wife in the privacy of the bedroom, in the privacy of the, of the house. What Allah Ta'ala wishes to tell us through the means of the nikah khutbah is that even in that moments of privacy, remember, O oh husband, that Allah is watching how you treat your wife. And O oh wife, remember, Allah is watching how you treat your husband. So the fourth thing, the fourth principle for the fulfillment and the beautiful guideline to better our human relationship is to have taqwa, to have the fear of Almighty Allah, to have the consciousness that Allah Ta'ala is with us with regard to the fulfillment of our fellow human being. The fifth principle. The, the great emphasis Islam has placed upon the fulfillment of human rights has even been emphasized to the extent the way Allah Ta'ala has made mention with regard to the people of Medina. They gave preference to others even when difficulty came their lot. They gave preference to others even when difficulty came their lot. They went through difficulty, but they tried to see that the next person must not go through difficulty. This is a strong emphasis of Islamic teaching with regard to the rights of your fellow human being. And when was this ayat revealed? This ayat was revealed that when the Muslims of Makkah migrated from Makkah to Medina, because they had left their home, their wealth and everything in Makkah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam paid them with other Ansari Sahaba in Medina. You look after this person. He is your brother, you take care of his financial and all other needs. The people of Medina went to such an extent to look after the Muhajirin's needs that they even distributed the wealth half. You take half, we'll keep half. Right. They, were, they did so much. There is no recorded instance of such great example and manifestation of brotherhood. But then a time came. Nabi Sallallahu went into an expedition. There were some spoils of war and booty that came to the Muslims. Nabi Sallallahu was faced with two situations. And Nabi Sallallahu called the Ansar with regard to the situation. Oh, people of Medina, I have this amount of spoils of war, this amount of booty. If I distribute it amongst all the Muslims, the way I'm, according to justice, we are supposed to do, the people of Makkah still won't receive that much that will make them financially independent. They will still won't be self-sufficient. Very little wealth will come their way. So, so if I still give it to everyone, you know, you will still have to look after them for a little while. Or otherwise, I only distribute it to the people of Makkah. 
I only distributed to the people of Makkah. Then that wealth will be sufficient that they will become self-dependent. Then you don't have to look after them. You don't have to care for their financial needs. What do the people of Medina say? The Ansar of Medina, that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, min al -iman. The love for the people of Medina is part of Iman. O Prophet of Almighty Allah, give it to them and we will still look after them. Give it to them. Distribute it solely to them and we will still look after them. We will still take care of their financial needs. Allah revealed this ayat. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَسَاسَةً They give preference to others even when difficulty comes a lot. If we can't do that, if that is a little too much, although that is what we are supposed to do. You see, we must understand, you know, this is the mu'min's life. He can't be selfish. We have, and unfortunately, the way of life that we have adopted by and large, and the system that we live in, the capitalist system breeds individualism. It breeds some sort of selfishness. But Islam, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, Khairun nas, nas. The best of people are those who are benefit to other people. We must understand that our destiny is linked to the destiny of mankind and humankind. It is impossible for you to be prosperous while the people around you are not prosperous or the people around you are in difficulty. Somewhere along the line is going to affect you. Somewhere along the line is going to affect you. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked by Azra Aisha, Anuhuliku wa fina salihun. Can we be destroyed when there are pious people in us? The Prophet ﷺ said, yet when evil becomes rampant, then even if you are pious on your own, that evil one will only overtake you. So our, our destiny is linked to the destiny of humankind. We are prosperous if our community and society is prosperous. If you live in an island that you feel that we are completely happy and in bliss, and the people around you are not in that particular situation, one day their discontent is going to affect you. One day their discontent is going to affect us, if it is not already affecting us. So this is one aspect that we must keep in mind. The fifth principle, you know, be in such a way, deal with your fellow human being in such a way, see to it that you fulfill his rights, even if it becomes difficult upon your own self. If you can't do that, then take the next step. And this Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, You cannot be a true believer until you like for your fellow human being what you like for yourself. What, you know, Without that, you cannot be a true believer. You cannot be a true believer until you like for your fellow human being what you like for yourself. And we take it even a step further. If you can't do that, we're talking about the various stages now. With fifth, what we said was, fulfill the rights of others even if it's difficult upon you. If you can't do that, at least do to your fellow human being what you like for yourself. If you can't do that, the least that you should do is to not cause harm and inconvenience to a fellow human being. That should be the very least and the minimum, without which you can't do without. Al-Muslimu man salim al-Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadi. A Muslim is who that other Muslims are safe from the evil and harms that can be caused by this person through the means of his tongue and to the means of his hand. That's the least that you can do. Do not hurt another person. Do not cause inconvenience to another person. Islam wants our society to be a society which is a model of civility and courteousness. What did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said? Hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Iman has 77 branches. And the greatest is Kalima la ilaha illallah wa adnaha al imatatul adha anit tariq. The lowest form of Iman is to remove an offensive item from the road that is commonly used by human beings. It's the lowest form of Iman. Take away something that is on the road that normally causes inconvenience to people. That is the lowest form of Iman. There is no lower form of Iman than that. See to it that you don't harm another person. How much emphasis Sharia has given upon this. I mean, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I made mention of this so many times when he used to get up at the time of Tahajjud. Fatah al baba ruwayda wa aghlak al baba ruwayda says, Hazrat Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha, he used to open the door gently, close the door gently, and so as not to disturb his sleeping wife. Someone will say, my wife, I, what if I come at night and, and make a noise and wake her up? I mean, what's, what is wrong? She's my wife, after all, she's living with me. Here, Nabi Sallallahu getting up for tahajjud, being so concerned that he must not disturb his sleeping wife, opens the door in such a manner. Can we imagine this is akhlaq, this is character? I mean, this is with his wife. 
whom normally people sometimes we can take the people in our household for granted. How much emphasis Nabi Sallallahu must have made with regard to not causing inconvenience to others. The Sahaba say when Nabi Sallallahu entered a room in which people were sleeping and some were awake, Nabi Sallallahu used to make salam in such a manner that the people who were awake would hear the salam. The people who were sleeping would not be disturbed by the salam of Nabi Sallallahu Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he wanted to address an evil that was taking place in the community and society. It is so easy to go to two extremes in this regard. One is extreme is you don't, you don't make mention of the evil. People are looking, doing all sorts of evil, you don't make mention of it. In that way, you are going to one extreme of compromising with the evil. And the other extreme is you make mention of the evil in such a manner that you embarrass the person who is doing it. There is also another extreme. So what did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam avoided both the extremes when there was an evil in the community and society, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to stand on the mimbar and said, Ma baalu aqwamin yef'aluna kada. What is wrong with the people that they are doing such and such a thing? What is wrong with people that they are doing such and such a thing? He used to correct the evil, make mention of it, but in such a manner that the people who were doing were not embarrassed. This is the akhlaq of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, something that even our scholars today have unfortunately have forsaken in this regard the way they correct the evil with regard to people. Sometimes becoming personal, sometimes giving vent to their anger, sometimes you know saying that you know we just gave it to the people. I mean that is not the way Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reformed the community and society. Then another aspect is after making mention of this various stages, the seventh thing that we should keep in mind is stay away from factors that can harm relationships. Now there are many factors and I won't go into all the factors. I just want to make mention of two or three. One of them is anger. <clears throat> Respected brothers, how much harm has been caused by anger is something that perhaps has not been caused by any other attribute. Especially the words that we say at the time of anger. Many a times we don't realize the harm, harm that is caused by saying things in anger. Anger of course is, an, as I said, a topic on its own. But just this aspect that by see to it that you don't say things in anger when you are with people whom you have relationship with, that is going to affect relationship. Be careful, restrain your tongue at the time of anger. Don't say things which are going to be harmful or hurtful. How many times have we heard, especially recently now, people giving three talaks and then afterwards saying that, that uh, you know, we didn't mean it or we said it in anger. No one is going to give, ang no one is going to give talak in love. Remember that. Talaq is only going to be given in anger. So that is why it is effective. Someone came to Muhammad Tanwi and said, I gave talaq in anger. So he said, you don't give talaq in love. You only give it in anger, therefore it is effective. So be careful what you say. Be careful what you say at the time of anger. Although it is difficult, the way someone has humorously said that the child psychologists tell us that we must not strike our children when we are angry. So when must we strike them? When they are kissing us or when they are recuperating from sickness, must we hit them that time? Obviously, you are going to hit them when you are angry, but what is meant here is that be careful. That is why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said that the Qazi must not give judgment when he is angry. The Qazi, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's command, the Qazi must not give judgment when he is angry. When he has cooled himself, then he must give judgment. By extension, it also means that anyone who is in authority, must not judge those who are under his authority when he's angry. So even the parent must not give punishment to the child when he's angry because there is a chance that you are going to give more punishment than what is necessary. You are going to strike out, strike out in anger. And brothers, this anger has its effect. No matter afterwards if you pacify yourself, after, afterwards if you ask for forgiveness, it's going to have its effect. The way I normally make mention of this incident, that a small child used to become very angry you know, from time to time. So the father, very worried with regard to the child's anger, wanted to do something to remedy it. So he told the child that every time you become angry, there is a back wall in our house, which is lying empty, which is vacant. Take a hammer, strike a nail on that particular wall. You know, take out and vent your anger on that wall. Take a hammer, hit the nail on that wall. Do it. So the first day, the child must have hit about 20 or 30 nails in that back wall because he used to get angry so, so often. So uh, you know, then he realized that every time I get angry, I go to go and according to what my father's instruction is, I must go and now go and hit that nail on the wall. It's better that I stay away from anger. So he slowly, slowly came away until one day he came triumphantly to his father and said, you know, today 
I never got angry. I didn't need to hit any nails on the wall. So Father said, Alhamdulillah, you did a very good thing. But now do another thing. For every day that you stay without anger, remove one of those nails. Oh right. So the, every day he didn't get angry, he removed one of those nails. One day again, he came back triumphantly after a while to his parents and said, look, all the walls, all the nails in the walls, all of them have been removed. I have remained so many days that I could take out all those nails from the wall and I have remained angry, remained free from anger in so many days. All the nails have been removed. So the father took him in the backyard and said, let me now tell you this lesson. Look at those nails that you have hit on the wall. You have taken them out, but has it left a mark or not? So the son said, yes, it has left a mark. So the father said, the lesson I want to tell you is that when you say things in anger, even afterwards if you retract, the effect is still there. What you said in anger is still going to remain there. You can't go and say afterwards, I was angry, forgive me. Once or two times you can help it. But after a while, that, that effect is going to be upon the person whom you are venting your anger to. This is something that we need to be careful about. How this way Nabi Sallallahu told the Sahabi when he came to him and said, give me advice. Nabi Sallallahu knew that he was prone to anger. Nabi Sallallahu said, for you the best advice is, don't get angry. Oh, Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu used to say, Ghussa pas na ane dena. Don't let anger come near you. Stay away from factors that make you angry. So this is very important, my dear. The Arabic poet says that when you strike someone with a sword, you can still have a cure for that. There's a cure, you can put a bandage. There is no cure for the wounds inflicted by the tongue. It remains etched in a person's memory for a very long time. So stay away from anger. The second thing that we need to stay away from, that as I say, staying away from factors that impair our relationship is suspicion. Now suspicion again, as I said, a topic on its own, but two aspects with regard to suspicion. One is to not become unnecessarily suspicious. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has clearly warned with regard to it. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, even if your suspicion is aroused, don't delve into suspicion. Try and, you know, don't get deep into suspicion. That's one of the aspects. And the th second thing that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said, don't air suspicion. Don't talk of You have a suspicion? Don't go make mention of it as a fact to people. You are creating fitna. You are causing harm to relationships. How can you go and air? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, airing suspicion is the most lying form of speech. Airing suspicion is the most lying and the most false form of speech. Because you are going to speak lies because you are airing not facts. You are airing that which you feel or what you are suspicious about. So stay away from erring. It is enough to call a person a liar when he relates everything what he hears without verifying it. That is also some of the things. And of course another aspect which sometimes is becoming very common in our community is that, you know, talking about factors that impair and harm relationship is to leave our financial matters vague. I will repeat that to leave our financial matters vague is a recipe for conflict, is a recipe for, for bad human relationship. It's a recipe. We sometimes in our own families, because you know it has been a tradition, we sit, we eat from the hall, one pot, no one knows what is happening. And the time comes at the time of the death of someone, then it erupts into a whole type of feud which is unnecessary, which goes against the Sharia. Because the Sharia wants that our financial matters must be clarified to the extent that the longest ayat in the Holy Quran does not refer to Salat, Zakat, Roza. The longest ayat in the Holy Quran, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu idha tadayantum bidaynin ila ajalim musamma faktubu, refers to the rectifying and the correction of our financial dealings with one another. Don't leave things vague. A person has a whole business, he's running it in partnership with his brothers, the sons come in, on what basis the sons come in? Nothing is clarified. Is he a partner in the business? Is he only a salaried employee? What is his position? You don't clarify it. You don't clarify it. In time to come, you are opening up the doors of conflict in your own family. Stay away from things that will impair human relationship and definitely one of the things that causes harm to human relationship is to leave your financial matters vague and unclarified. This has been not once, many and repeatedly we are finding this particular situation 
that because of this, how many type of disputes have come about in the families because of this particular situation. So there are many other aspects. You can quote backbiting and all those type of things. But I think three are such that causes perhaps uh, more harm than others in terms of human relationship. Anger, suspicion, and thirdly is leaving your affairs vague. These are recipes for, for human relationships to de deteriorate. After understanding this, the eighth thing, making mention with regard to how to improve human relationships. The eighth thing is that we must be forgiving to one another. Brothers, each and every one of us are human beings. And as human beings, Allah Ta'ala says, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ذَعِفَةً Allah has created us weak. And when Allah has created us weak, we have within us, each and every one has his fair share of weakness and shortcomings. And when we deal with the shortcomings of one another, let us deal with forgiveness and compassion. Let us deal with the shortcomings of one another with forgiveness and compassion. And this is the way our beloved Nabi Karim Sallallahu look at the weakness and the shortcomings of others not with a finger of accusation, which is just becoming too commonplace in our community and society. Don't look at the shortcomings and the weakness of another person with a finger of accusation. It is too commonplace in our community and society. Look at the weakness and the shortcomings of others with an with a attitude of mercy and compassion. A sahabi one day came in the presence of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was performing Salat. And he sneezed loud in Salat. Not knowing the etiquette of Salat, he said, Alhamdulillah, loudly. Loudly the whole masjid could hear. Now what would he have done? Perhaps we would have at the end of the day said, don't you know the etiquette of the masjid? I mean, Jahil Gengo, don't you, such an ignorant person, what don't you know? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said this, the, some of the Sahaba looked at him with huge eyes. He said, I was a young person. I was a young person. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called me after Salat. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told me that you don't say the Alhamdulillah loud when you sneeze when you are in Salat in the whole masjid because you are causing harm and inconvenience and it's not the proper etiquette while you are in Salat. And he said, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained to me in such a manner, Ma kaharani, he did not rebuke me. Wala shatamani, he did, not, he did not abuse me. Ma darabani, he did not hit me, I was small. Ma ra'aytu mu'alliman qablahu wala ba'dahu ahsana min. I never saw a teacher before this or after this better than our beloved Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This, this is the way that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam treated the way when you see the shortcomings of people. Not with an accusing finger, with compassion and mercy. Hazrat Shaykh Rahmatullah Ali, Hazrat Shaykh Al Hadid, Hazrat Muhammad Zakaria Sahib Rahmatullah Ali, was one day, you know, telling the servant something. Certain things he told him, and the servant repeatedly went against the instruction of Hazrat Muhammad Shaykh Al Hadid, Hazrat Muhammad Zakaria Sahib Rahmatullah Ali. So Muhammad Zakaria Sahib Rahmatullah Ali became angry. And that person said, Maaf karna. So Hazrat Shaykh Al Hadid, Hazrat Muhammad Zakaria Sahib Rahmatullah Ali said, How many times must I forgive you? How many times I have told you this, and you are repeatedly making the same mistake? Hazrat Mawlana Ilyas sahab rahmatullah alayhi was near Mawlana Zakaria sahab rahmatullah alayhi and said, forgive him as many times you would like your sins to be forgiven on the day of Qiyamat. Forgive him as many times as you would like your sins to be forgiven on the day of Qiyamat. That's how many times you forgive a person. Don't look at the, at the faults of others with an accusing finger. Look at it with mercy and compassion. This is what is the sunnah of our beloved Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then another aspect, my dear respected brothers, Make every person feel important. Make every person feel important. Wallah, every person is important. Every person, every human being. Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَكَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. This is not my and yours declaration. This is a declaration of Allah. We have honored Bani Adam. We have honored the son of Adam alayhi salam. Meaning we have honored. Allah doesn't say we have honored the Muslim. Allah said, we have honored human beings. When Allah Ta'ala has given people honor, why don't you show honor to that which Allah has granted honor? By give each and every person his proper, proper due and his worth and grant him importance. Aristotle, the famous Greek philosopher, had said, the root cause of enmity and hostility is when a person feels slighted. When he feels slighted and feel hurt and embarrassed by another person, that is the root cause of enmity and hostility. And that is what, oh, look at what our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, each and every person has importance. And especially the mu'min and the believer. 
Nabi Akram saw Salam made mention with regard to Kaaba, the Kaaba and the Baytullah, that Baytullah which the first brick was placed by Hazrat Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, rebuilt by Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, which is the focus and the direction of our salah, that Kaaba and the Baytullah which we face our salat in that particular direction, which we make tawaf of here in this world and adjacent and on top of it in Baytul Ma'amur in the seven heavens, the angels make tawaf of Baytul Ma'amur in the seven heavens. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one day told us the Kaaba and Baytullah addressed it, very great is your status and your worth and your rank, but wallah, the status and the azmat and the honor of one believer is even greater than you. This is the, the worth of each and every human being. And this was once again, the distinguishing feature of our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He made each and every person feel important. Although Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rank and status was very great. And compared to the, the Ummati, I mean, compared to the Ummah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's status was so great. But look at how Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam treated the Ummah. Wa shawirun fil amr. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to consult them. Although Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to gain wahi from Almighty Allah. Apparently there was no need for consultation. Nazar Umar radiallahu ta'ala is going for Umrah. He comes and tells Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I'm going for Umrah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ya Ukhayya, la tansana fi du'aik. Oh my small brother, don't forget me in your du'as. The Nabi of Allah telling his companion, Oh my small brother, don't forget me in your du'as. Give each and every person importance. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one day with Hazrat Hussein on his back. The grandson of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the grandfather, like how many a times taking the grandchild on a ride for a ride, you know, taking some moments of pleasure with the grandchild. One person comes by, tells Hazrat Hussein, young, you could understand, oh, what a beautiful mount you are riding on. What a beautiful mount you are riding on the back of your grandfather, the Nabi of Allah. What did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? Tell the person, don't you see what a beautiful rider I have on my back? Look at what a beautiful rider I've got on me. You are telling what a beautiful mount you are telling my small grandchild. Look at what a beautiful rider I've got. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As one day came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rasulullah, am I closer to you or is Abu Bakr closer to you? What did, what did he ask Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Ya Rasulullah, am I closer to you or is Abu Bakr closer to you? Now the answer I will make mention of, but what was the reason why he asked the question? Because the Sahabis, the Sahaba say that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to deal with every Sahabi and every Sahabi felt that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was closest towards me. Every Sahabi felt Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was closest towards me. That's why he came and asked Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this question. But because there was a religious edict that was dependent upon the answer of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Abu Bakr was to follow Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the first Khalifa. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to say that no, Abu Bakr is more closer towards me. But that is one aspect. But think, why did he ask the question? Because every Sahabi felt that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is closest towards me. I mean, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba said that a small child used to come and catch the hand of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and take Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam anywhere in Medina, wherever he was, she wanted or he wanted. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he used to catch the hands of someone in Salam, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was never the first to remove the salam, never the first to remove the hand. This, this is akhlaq, give each and every one importance. Yes, we know we sometimes lead a active life, sometimes we are in a hurry. It does happen, we also need to understand that. But at least we need to try and see, give each and every person importance. And then of course the tenth thing which I would conclude with is, and just go very briefly to make mention with regard to aspects that we need to stay away from disputes and arguments, Another aspect, and remember one aspect, that when, when we show compassion to others, brothers, when we show compassion to others, and we show mercy to others, it's not out of weakness. A Muslim is not weak. A Muslim is strong and brave and courageous to the extent that as far as his bravery is concerned, he would, he would confront the, the battle forces of the world. That is his bravery. That is his courage and that is his conviction. He does not show mercy and compassion out of weakness. His bravery is there. But remember, mercy and compassion is an attribute of power, not an attribute of weakness. A weak person can only beg for mercy. He can't give mercy. A weak person begs for mercy. A helpless person begs for mercy. A strong person is he who dispenses with mercy and compassion. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
when he showed mercy and compassion, it wasn't out of weakness, it was because of the strength that Allah Ta'ala had granted him. And the tenth thing, my dear respected brothers, with regard to bettering human relationship is that we must not adopt a superior attitude towards people. Deal with people in a manner that you show your humility. And this is a very important aspect with regard to our dealing with people. Look at what Allah Ta'ala says in, says, says in Surah Al-Hujarat. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا يَسْخَرَ قَوْمٌ مِّن قَوْمٍ عَسَىٰ أَيْ يَكُونَ خَيْرًا مِّنْهُنَّ That, O oh, believers, do not mock at another person because the person whom you are mocking might be better than you in the eyes of Allah. You are showing that you think that you are superior, you are mocking another person. He might be superior to you in the eyes of Almighty Allah. Abdullah ibn Masud was a thin and frail person. He was climbing off down a tree one day and he was a very thin person. People and his calves became revealed, the bottom part of his leg, and people started laughing at him. And Nabi Sallallahu saw them laughing and said, are you laughing at Abdullah? Are you laughing at me? He's so weak and frail. Wallah, on the day of Qiyamah, he would appear on him and his scale of deeds will be more weightier than Mount of Uhad. You are laughing at him because of his physical frailty. This is how he is in the sight of Almighty Allah. Where do we have the superior attitude with regard to how we deal with people? It is completely against the sunnah of our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah. Look at how Hazrat Zaid ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu in Shamayl al-Tirmidhi makes mention of some of the, the beauty of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's akhlaq. And he said, إِذَا ذَكَرْنَا الدُّنْيَا ذَكَرَهَا مَعَنَا وَإِذَا ذَكَرْنَا الْعَاخِرَةَ ذَكَرَهَا مَعَنَا إِذَا ذَكَرْنَا التَّعَامُ ذَكَرَهُ مَعَنَا Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was such that when the sahaba used to discuss worldly affairs, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to join in the discussion. When he used to discuss about the Akhirah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to join in the discussion and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make mention of it from his perspective. And when he used to speak about food, the Sahaba said, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also used to join us. This is Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not having a sense of superiority. Yadhaku mimma yadhaku nabi. He used to laugh and with regard to those things that the people used to laugh about. وَيَتَعَجَّبُ mimma يَتَعَجَّبُ nabi. And he used to find amazing what other people used to find amazing. You know, there is very many beautiful, you know, just give you another example. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given glad tidings for a person who memorizes 40 a hadith. 40 a hadith, whoever memorizes it. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given him glad tidings of Jannah. Whoever knows 40 hadith, because of this particular virtue, many scholars have written Arba'in, you know, the 40 hadith of their own particular discretion which they like. But out of all those scholars who have written, the most famous amongst those, Arba'in of Imam Nabawi Rahmatullah And the ulama say one of the reasons why Imam Nabawi Rahmatullah is Arba'in had such popularity is because Imam Nabawi was a man of the people. He used to mix with people frequently. He was a man of the people. He didn't keep himself aloof and have a sense of superiority. This was the, the reason why out of the many Arba'ins written, the one of the most popular is the Arba'in of Imam Nabawi Rahmatullah because of this particular. And this is what even our Akabirin, our many great scholars, uh, Mufti Azizur Rahman Rahmatullahi was the first Mufti of Darul Ulum Dioban. He used to in Dioban go and look after the widows and every morning before he used to go to his iftar, he used to go and buy the goods for the widows. He used to go and buy the goods from the marketplaces. What you want from this home and he, because they were widows, they didn't have anyone, he used to go and buy from them. He says sometimes he used to come back, the widows used to complain, you bought the wrong thing. And you say that he remembers very clearly that they told him this. But when they came back and he brought it, they used to say, you brought the wrong thing. He said, I never used to argue with them. I used to take it, go back to the marketplaces, change it and bring it back. This was the way that we, we deal with people, not with a sense of superiority, but always having full humility before Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers, lastly, very one or two aspects with regard to disputes. We have said, and we must keep in mind that disputes and argumentations are very, very harmful. It is not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes. It is because of argumentation and dispute that we were deprived, the Ummah is deprived of the exact and precise date of the night of Laylatul Qadr. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and told the Ummah with regard to when Laylatul Qadr is. And he said, I saw two people arguing in dispute. And because of that, Allah Ta'ala removed and took away the knowledge of when the night of Laylatul Qadr is going to be. It's a different matter that there's other wisdoms on that, but it is a different matter. But because of that, look at the, the aspect of the removal of Barakah because of arguments and disputes. One day Nabi Karim Sallallahu told the Sahaba, should I not show you, should I not tell you something 
which is even more virtuous and rewarding by Allah than your salat and your zakat. Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, Bala, definitely tell us. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Islahu Dhatul Bayyin. And that is, reconcile people who are arguing and disputing. Reconcile them. Because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, argumentation and disputes, he al haliqa It shaves off. It shaves off. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I don't say it shaves off your hair, but it shaves off your religion. It shaves off your religion. Argumentation and disputes shave off your religion. Therefore, stay away. As it Luqman alayhi salatu used to say, may, whoever used to say, may yuksirul mara yashtim o yushtam. He who gets involved in arguments, either he would swear at other person, at another person, or he would be sworn at. Person who gets involved in arguments, either he will swear at someone, or somewhere along the line, someone will swear him. So stay away from arguments. And there's a first thing after understanding that how how harmful argument, argumentation and disputes is. You know, there is a hadith of our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, It is not permissible for a person to shun his next Muslim brother out of enmity and hostility for more than three days. Allah gives you a cooling off period for three days, but after that Allah Ta'ala wants you to, to settle your differences and reconcile before the third day is finished and expires. Because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah Ta'ala opens up the doors of Jannah on on Monday and Thursday, Allah forgives. By and large, Allah Ta'ala forgives people except the person who associate partners to Almighty Allah and except the person whom there is an argument between him and his next Muslim brother. Allah Ta'ala tells the Malaika, leave his situation. Do we don't announce his forgiveness until he reconciles with his next Muslim brother. And how do we think? After understanding the harmful effects of disputes and arguments, the first thing that we need to do is to walk away from arguments and disputes. Before arguments come to you, walk away from it. What does Allah Ta'ala say in the Quran? When the ignorant come and dispute with you, tell them to them, Salam, peace be upon you. You're on your way, me on my way. Don't get involved in disputes with people. You know, avoid, avoid disputes before it becomes a reality. And especially religious type of disputes, brothers. As first of all, the ulama have said religious disputes and arguments is exclusive to the ulama, those who are learned. As far as possible, stay away from this religious types of disputes. You know, those types of things, the way Akbar al Abadi has said, uh, the way Akbar al Abadi has said, Mazhabi bahas mene kihi nahi. Mazhabi bahas mene kihi nahi. Faltu akal mujme tihi nahi. I never got involved in religious disputes because I never have any spare brains and intellect to get involved in that. I didn't get involved in that. And another aspect with regard to religious disputes is this, that normally when we get involved in those type of disputes, the, the intention should be to find the truth. The intention should be to find the truth. Whereas today when we get involved in our type of religious disputes, not, the intention is not there. The intention is to show I am right, you are wrong. There is no more the intention that we need to find the truth, therefore let us discuss and dispute or argue. Nowadays, the argumentation and dispute, I am right, you are wrong. That is how the whole argument is based on. Otherwise, arguing in terms of the proper method, in academic method, in religious scholarship is, is proven. And one of the most amazing statements you will find with regard to this is a statement of Imam Shafi Rahmatullah when he said, Whenever I argued and dispute a religious point with another person, I always made dua that Allah puts the truth on his tongue that I can submit to the truth. One of the most amazing statements you will find with regard to argumentation and disputes. But otherwise, my dear respected brothers, walk away from an argument as far as possible. This is something that we need to learn. Avoid it before it comes a reality. And remember, it takes you to make a quarrel. It takes you, the individual, to make a quarrel. They normally say that, uh, you know, the, the wife always has the last say in any argument. Whatever the husband says thereafter is the beginning of another argument. <laughs> said, that is also, but we're, what we are trying to say is that avoid arguments as far as possible. Don't let you come near arguments. And if, for example, there is a situation where it goes beyond that, then the next step is forego your rights. Forego your rights as far as possible. As far as possible, forego your rights. Ask, you, ask of your rights from Almighty Allah. Ana za'im. Look at this beautiful hadith. Abu Dawud Sharif hadith. Ana za'imun bi baytin fi wasat al-jannah 
لمن ترك المرا وهو محق i guarantee a house in the middle of jannah for a person who walks away from an argument although he knows i am right i guarantee a house in the middle of jannah for a person who walks away from an argument despite the fact that he knows that i am on the right so stay away from argument second thing you know as far as possible forego your rights in any particular type of arguments we're not saying that you must forego your rights completely but as far as possible if you can do do away with it allah will give you more allah there are many examples with regard to this and many of our arguments my dear respected brothers at the end of the day they are shallow they are completely shallow the way there is an example of akbar al habadi akbar al habadi was i think it was most probably akbar al habadi mohammed shamal al thani rahmatullah alayhi has made mention of this incident was going for studies and now those days when you used to go for studies you used to go for many many years not like today students that comes home every day or every week you know from the from the the boarding etc but those days the student used to go for many years he used to stay there so when he was going you know the father wanted to show him some special favor by tell me what you want so that child was a small child what can he ask when he asked for something he asked for a toy because that was what the child and children of that age were inclined towards so he asked for a toy so he couldn't find the toy in the market places in the bazaars before he left but after he went away he found the toy and he kept it at home now akbar al abadi comes after many many years as now he is a graduate and now he is a learned person the people are all around his friends and his uncles and his relatives have all come to meet him the father takes out the toy and gives it now to the professor sahab now he feel he's feeling embarrassed obviously a toy that you require and you take when you are age of 9 10 when you are 20 someone gives you the same thing obviously you will feel a little embarrassed about it so the father realized the embarrassment with regard to the on the face of his son and he said oh my son i want to give you a lesson that this toy you yourself you you asked for it you requested for it so today you are embarrassed and ashamed with regard to your request which you had made some years back but therefore the lesson i want to give you is don't do something today that you will be embarrassed on the after don't do something today that you will feel embarrassed on the day of qiyamah and allah taala says iqra kitabak read your book of deeds don't don't do things that today to on the day of qiyamah allah must embarrass us may allah taala save us from embarrassment on the day of qiyamah so these are aspects that as far as possible you will find many of our arguments you know in reality they are not worth your arguing about when you look at it at the end of the day so as far as possible forego your rights allah taala will grant you the greater reward with regard to it and of course if you can't do that then the third thing that you should try and do is compromise sulah what is sulah is us sulh khair allah taala says in the quran compromise is better what is compromise compromise is mutual negotiation the person who you have an argument with you go and approach him you talk over your matter and sometimes for the sake for the sake of reaching a compromise even if you have to accept something less than what is your full due by all means go and do it go make sulah compromise allah loves compromises if it's less because sometimes in the long run it is better to take something less than to insist upon your full share because then you you get obsessed with it you become you know you you are taken back by depression and grief and it causes whole lot of as far sulah and if you feel you can't do sulah then the fourth thing is sharia has given us the way out of with regard to arguments and dispute is to go through the means of arbitration go to someone whom you both have trust in and ask him to arbitrate in the matter وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاقَ بَيْنِهِمَا if you have a problem in the marriage فَبَثُوا حَكَمَ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمَ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا let the wife have one particular arbitrator let the husband have one arbitrator let them both come together إِنْ يُرِيدَ إِسْلَاحِ يُوَفِّقِ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمَا if they both come together in the spirit of reconciliation Allah will reconcile them so go to another person if you feel that you can so four steps as far as possible first stay away from argument don't get into involved in the argument if you have to get involved and sometimes you can't stay away from it rather you be the one who compromise and you be the one who sort of forego his rights the third step is go go compromise take less than what is your full due for the sake of reaching a overall settlement and the fourth thing if you can't do that then go the route of arbitration but as far as possible stay away from all types of argumentations and disputes whether it be in the family whether it be between husband and wife or in any particular type of situation lastly i would like to conclude with hazrat muan abul hasan nadwi rahmatullah alai has written in one of his books he writes in a very beautifully the way hazrat muana used to have a very beautiful pen and he says and in fact it is part of a poem 
that Imam Jalaluddin, Imam Jalaluddin Rumi Rahmatullah Ali has written a certain poem which Allama Iqbal has also opened his asrar e khudi the secrets of the self, with these very same verses of Imam Jalaluddin Rumi. And he talks of a saint who was one day in the evening going with a lantern, with a lamp, as he was looking for something. So the passerby asked him, that, what are you looking for? He said, what are you looking for? He said, I have grown sick of living in the abode of wild animals. And I'm looking for a man, a human being, who would restore my faith in humanity. The poet who asked the saint who was going around with this particular lamp, he said, you are looking for the impossible. That which does not exist in his truest sense. So the saintly person told him, that is my problem, that that which has become impossible or difficult to find, that is what I am looking for. And then after making mention of this, Hazrat Muhammad Abu Hassan Nabi Rahmatullahi writes with regard to humanity, that what we are supposed to have is human beings whose hearts throb and eyes weep for the sake of humanity. Human beings who control their carnal desires and were the riders and not the mounts of civilization, who hold the reins of life instead of being driven by life. Men who do not like the tension and conflict that abounds in this world and hated, hated the selfishness and greed that abounds in today's world. People who are eager to give and not only to grab and give and, and to receive. People who do not believe that the aim of life is only to eat and drink and be merry, but also thought that there was great pleasure in feeding and helping others. Men who dreamt of the reconstruction of the world and of humanity and were not concerned solely of the growth and development of their own family, their own people and their own community. Who wanted to see the world united, not on the artificial platform of the United Nations, but on the real and the natural stage of the oneness of humankind. That is what we are supposed to strive towards. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me the tawfiq of understanding and making amal. And we hope, inshallah, this few things that we have made mention of would go a long way in improving our interpersonal relationship between us on a family level, on a community, on a society level, on a broader humanity level. Wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina wa nabiyyana wa mawlana Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayti ya dal jalali wa likaram. Allahumma rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunanna min al-khasirin. Allahumma thabbitna ala al-iman wa amitna ala al-iman wa ashurna yawm al-qiyamati ma al-iman. اللهم ألف بين قلوبنا وأصلح ذات بيننا وحدنا سبل السلام وأخرجنا من الظلمات إلى النور وجنبنا الفواحش والفتن ما ظهر منها وما بطن وبارك لنا في أسمائنا وأبصارنا وقواتنا وأزواجنا ما عهيتنا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين